We are back here on the AUA Inside Track podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Brian McNeil, a urologist with SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University in Brooklyn, New York City. Welcome, Dr. McNeil, and tell us about how the COVID-19 situation is going at your institution right now. Well, first off, Casey, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's uh, good to talk to you and good to reconnect with members of the AUA. I was looking forward to seeing everybody at the National Convention in uh, D.C., but we will be seeing each other again soon. So I miss everyone, first and foremost. And as far as how I'm doing here in Brooklyn, things seem to be settling down a little bit regarding uh, covid Uh, My fingers are crossed. I think the ideal way to define it is to say that we are cautiously optimistic. Cautiously, though. What's your experience been like? How has your day-to-day work shifted and changed as this pandemic hit New York City? My daily practice has changed, as well as the practice of all urologists, I think, who work in a tri-state area. Um, For me, my hospital was deemed a COVID-only facility by Governor Cuomo. So we saw sort of an onslaught of uh, COVID patients during the surge, and our ICUs were full. They actually remained fairly full, and our emergency room was overwhelmed, and we all pretty much had to come together. You know, a mentor of mine several years ago told me that while I am a urologist, you're a physician first, and that's the thought that comes to mind when I think of the pandemic and how we've responded to it as a urological community, you know, worldwide, and especially in New York. Tell us about working with COVID-19 patients. How did it feel? What was your confidence level dealing with this type of pandemic? I got to admit to you, initially, early on, I was a little worried. I was a little concerned for my own safety, and especially the safety of my uh, residents, because I didn't want to unnecessarily expose them if I didn't have to. So there were a few different measures that we put in place. We tried to set systems up where residents could stay at home and they would only come to the hospital for urgent consults if necessary. And I actually spent more time in the hospital than I had before so I could sort of see and deal with the consults myself. And, you know, just kind of going into the COVID units and dealing with the patients, uh, of course, we... You know, everyone needed an an adequate supply of uh, personal protective equipment, and that was an issue for a while. But luckily, I always had what I needed, and uh, it's it's challenging. It touches you in a way because you feel incredibly sad because you see patients suffering and dealing with this illness, and they're dealing with this alone. And I say that they're dealing with it alone because we've restricted visitor access. So you have folks in hospitals all around dealing with this alone without their family members being nearby. And and, and I felt incredibly sad for them. So just tell me about life in New York City during this pandemic. Well, life in New York City has uh, completely been turned upside down, so to speak, and it has changed. Uh, Luckily, uh, most folks are following the social distancing guidelines and a number of businesses have shut down. So once buzzing streets are somewhat deserted. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. You know, I kind of live in Manhattan, and uh, I commute to Brooklyn to the hospital, and oftentimes I would catch the subway. But during this pandemic, I've avoided the subway, and so I walk. So I probably walk about six, six and a half miles from my home to the hospital, and it makes me, one, I'm incredibly grateful for all of the uh, first responders and the essential employees we, I often see the same people on the street as I'm walking, and we'll sort of wave and say hello to each other. And, you know, it's just amazing to think that a buzzing, busy metropolis has shut down in a lot of ways. Yeah, we've heard stories about healthcare providers who wear their scrubs on the street, getting uh, people randomly applauding them on the street. And then I think at every night at 7 p.m., there's been a communal cheer that goes out and echoes through the streets as a sign of appreciation to all the essential workers and healthcare providers. What's that been like being on the receiving end of some of those accolades? I tell you, that has been one of the greatest things about this experience. Of course, this is challenging. It's a stress on the world. Uh, People are suffering. Um, There are other folks who are, you know, losing their lives. 
people are losing loved ones. But if you try to look at the bright side of things, I think that this is something that has brought us together in a way in which uh, we were not before. You know, I feel a sense of camaraderie with, you know, fellow physicians from other services, and I also feel a greater connection to the community. You know, I, I felt, you know, appreciated before as a practitioner, but the appreciation that I feel right now uh, whenever I walk the streets, whenever I see people, whether I know them or not, it's just tremendous. And you mentioned the applause that sometimes occurs. Uh, at 7 o'clock most evenings, you know, people will sort of uh, clap outside of their windows and decks and stuff like that and show appreciation for, you know, health care providers, whether it's respiratory therapists, nursing, support staff, physicians. You know, we're we're sort of all in this together. And there's a tremendous sense of community, unlike I've ever seen or experienced before. Tell me more about that sense of community. How are you and your colleagues coming together and supporting each other during this uncertain time? You know, we support each other in different ways. I I think that uh, this pandemic has also stressed the importance of communication. And sometimes we don't communicate as well as we need to. But during this time of crisis, we have over-communicated in a way. Uh, Within my department at Downstate, actually, we hold a town hall, sort of a morning check-in three times a week, where we will sit around together on a Zoom call and we will survey everyone just to do a check-in to see how everyone's feeling, to see how everyone's family's feeling, and also to update each other on uh, necessary news regarding the crisis. So it's it's something that's been uh, great. And also, I'll fully disclose this to you and the rest of the, of the uh, urologic community. Um, I actually got an executive MBA. I wrapped up business school. And I didn't quite realize the importance of coaching. Uh, for some people, leadership is innate. But for other folks, uh, you can you can be coached to be a better leader. And during this time, I've employed the services of a uh, professional coach and someone who sort of helps with crisis management. So uh, myself personally, I've had a weekly check-in with my coach just to ensure that I'm doing okay and also to ensure that I'm leading well. Given all you've experienced so far, what advice and insight would you give to your colleagues around the world as they too manage through this COVID-19 pandemic? Kind of having perspective is important. And one sort of uh, saying that comes to mind, and I, I can't remember where I first saw this. I will not claim credit for this. It is not an original thought. It is something that I've, that I saw some time ago, and I adopted it. And the saying is, never be afraid of failing, but absolutely terrified of regret. And I'll sort of expand on that a bit. You know, dealing with this pandemic, being, you know, a a healthcare practitioner, you know, we we all sort of face some sort of fear. We want to combat this virus and we want to do what we can to help all of those who need it. But there is a little bit of fear. And also, there may be a fear of failing. And the way that I've combated that, my own of, you know, fear of failing, is that you know, I'm going to do all that I can to help those in need. And if I do make a mistake or fail in some way, as long as I sort of fail and fall forward, then that will keep me going and add to the positive momentum that I feel I've, uh, I've generated and the positive momentum that I share with, you know, all other healthcare providers during this time. As far as your medical training, what do you think best prepared you for this pandemic? Well, for that, I would have to go back to uh, my residency training and uh, my time as a surgical intern. I I trained at the Loyola uh, University uh, Medical Center uh, just out of Chicago in Maywood, Illinois. And You know, the rigors of the general surgery intern experience there gave me a lot of ICU experience, which, believe it or not, I haven't lost that much of it over the years. So that's something that's been, you know, helpful, just kind of remembering how vents work, how do you make vent adjustments and things of that nature. I haven't had to do much of that 
you know, where I sit now, but I've understood certain things that have been done. So I think that, you know, as a urologist, you know, we sort of, we're, we're surgeons, but we're also uh, medical doctors in a way. Uh, you know, being, being a body plumber is a good thing and has provided me with a foundation to feel helpful uh, during this crisis. And as I said before, we may be subspecialists. We're urologists, yeah, but we're physicians first. We're docs first. I know you told me you spoke last week on a webinar with some of your colleagues with the Society of Academic Urology. How'd that go, and what did you discuss on that webinar? That was actually great, uh, just to come together and to share our experiences. I uh, participated on a panel with uh, two good friends of mine, Rich Lee, uh, who's a urologist at uh, Cornell. He's the program director there. And also Matt Matthew Sorensen, who's the program director at the University of Washington. And we covered, uh, our topic was entitled Covering the Front Lines, the Broad Impact of Redeployment. And we spoke about how we prepared for the COVID surge at our individual institutions, um, deploying urologists, whether attending staff or residents, to support other services. We spoke about picking up the pieces after the pandemic and lessons learned. So it was a great time just to share and to connect and to uh, learn from each other learn from those in the community that share their thoughts. What were some key lessons that you learned? For me, one thing that I I think that we all need to focus on is mental health and uh, personal wellness. And, you know, I I don't think that we have always paid enough attention to that. And one of the key takeaways for me was mental preparedness and the importance of coaching your house staff. Or even your colleagues, if you think about it, no matter where you are in an organization, you have to manage up, you have to manage at your same level, you have to manage down, and you have to manage yourself. And it's important to realize that at times we all face fear and uncertainty. You know, we all may have insecurities. We're all dealing with social isolation uh, in this time. However, it's so important to see the opportunity in this the opportunity to fulfill your calling as a physician, the opportunity to build confidence, and the opportunity to contribute to an effort to combat something unlike anything we've seen in our lifetimes. Dr. McNeil, do you have anything else to add or any other final thoughts before we wrap up today's interview? I'd just like to say that to anyone who's uh, listening to us, Please, uh, you know, just keep going. This is a challenging time. It's tough. There's some good days. There's some bad days. But folks really need you. People out there really appreciate what you're doing. And we are all in this together. All of us. We are all in this together. And while this is a uh, challenging illness that we're facing, I believe that humankind worldwide We can come together, and I think that we will be adjusting to a new normal in a way, Uh, but I I, I sort of remain confident that in some ways we will be better off on the other side because of the lessons that we learned during this time. Dr. Brian McNeil, a urologist with SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. McNeil, and thank you for all you're doing there in New York City. Thanks. It was great to catch up, Casey.